chapter 17, in which Frightful feels the call to the sky. Atop the mill house, Oxy turned her head almost all the way around in one direction and then the other. She saw trees, boulders, the mill pond, and high above them, a bright glimpse of blue sky. The sky captivated her. She sensed she should be there. She flapped her wings. Nothing happened. The air was still. No wind gave her lift. She closed her wings to her body and flicked her tail in frustration. She needed to be in that sky. Frifle walked Oxy, watched Oxy from Sam's tree. Her eyes had taken her first flight. She was no longer a nestling, but a fledgling, a flying member of bird royalty. The family felt Conadai. But Frifle was not about to join Chuck wandering free on wing. She had still another duty, to provide food until Oxy could catch her own. Oxy's mood changed from frustration to curiosity. She turned her head almost upside down to focus on a twisting leaf, a flying beetle, and a bird. Birds excited her. She lifted her wings to chase, thought better of it, and folded them to her sides. Eventually, she grew tired and put her beak in the feathers between her shoulders to sleep. The afternoon shadows lengthened and turned purple-blue. Up in the big tree, Frifle closed her eyes. From time to time, she opened them and checked on Oxy. Sam read on. Mole chewed on the deer bone. Suddenly, Sam, where are you? Banda was running toward the big tree, waving his arms. Oxy awakened and flapped her wings. A gust of wind rushed under them and lifted her off the roof. In seconds, she was above the hemlock grove on her way somewhere. Sam saw Oxy soaring to independence at the same time he heard Bandel shout, It's a girl! It's a girl! Her name is Samantha! Samantha? Sam said, and Oxy was forgotten. Who named her that? Zella said Bando as he caught his breath from running. Sam couldn't speak. Now we have a son and a daughter, Bando said, putting his hand on Sam's shoulder. Those are Zella's words. Sam ran his fingers through his hair, trying to take in the wonder of having a namesake. I've got to get back to the hospital, Bando said, and I'll pick up my surprise for Zella and Samantha, he winked. Think she'll like it? Sam still could not speak. Bandle's blue eyes shone under the black, the dark, his dark eyebrows and prematurely white hair. His face crinkled around a big smile. He waited for Sam to say something, realized he was overwhelmed, and hurried off to the mill house. Samantha, Sam finally said, as his friend of the forest and wilderness left the mill house, carrying on his head the exquisite wild cherry rocking chair he had been working on for eight months. Samantha, Sam whispered to himself. I have a new friend. Frightful did not hear the excitement. Oxy had disappeared over the mountain and she was speeding to catch up with her daughter. She finally took the lead and steered to Sam's meadow. She alighted on the limb of an oak tree. Oxy landed on a hickory stub. Frightful scanned the meadow. Oxy scanned it too. A, fr- a rabbit jumped. Instinctively, Oxy dropped from her perch. She missed. She hit where the rabbit had been, not where it would be by the time she struck. The rabbit dove into a patch of green brier, and Oxy flew back to her perch. While she sat waiting for something else to run, Frifle flew back to the courthouse. She returned in the late afternoon, but brought no food. Oxy, who had still not caught anything, ravenously attacked her mother. Frifle dodged, climbed swiftly, and sped back to the cupola. In the morning, she caught a pigeon. Oxy saw Frightful fly toward her with food when she was still a long way off. She waited, then attacked. Frightful dropped the pigeon. With a twist, Oxy caught it in the air and returned to the oak tree. She ate rapaciously. Although she had never been taught this, Frightful was following ancient peregrine instincts. She was hacking her daughter, bringing her food when she could not catch her own. We're going to skip to page 218. That same morning, Oxy was sitting in Sam's meadow, hunting by, sitting up high, waiting for something to move. As the hours passed and she saw nothing, she changed her technique. She came down and skimmed over the tops of the knapweed and grasses to scare up the prey. A rat saw her and ran. She dove, missed, and headed back to the oak tree. A small house sparrow came by and she chased it. It dropped out of sight. A rabbit darted off through the weeds. Oxy tail chased the rabbit. It ran right, then left, right, left, its white tail warning the other rabbits to hide. 
Oxy chased right, then left, right, left, and speeded up to strike. The rabbit slipped under a pile of brush and was gone. Oxy flew back to the oak tree. When Pfeiffer returned to Sam's Meadow the next day, Oxy chased her down the mountain. They lit on the bridge at Del Hive. Flocks of ducks and shorebirds had migrated down from the Arctic. They were swimming and eating below the two falcons on the west branch of the Delaware. The ducks fled when they saw the peregrines. Oxy chased the group, missed them all, looped, and came back to the bridge. She stood tall and alert. The water, the birds, the sky excited her. The open space felt right to her. Before nightfall, she had snatched a mallard duck that was dying from pesticide poisoning. She carried it to a gingerbread platform near the top of Molly's Victorian house. In the early morning, a Cree awoke her. Blue Bill was circling the bridge. She recognized him. Although more than a month had passed, she had la although more than a month had passed since she had last seen him, she flew to him and together they they rollicked above the bridge and tumbling on air currents, they bounced and rippled like water. Frightful saw Bluebill and Oxy circling and diving. She flew to them, and the three falcons played on the invisible roller coasters of wing. When Frightful discovered what skilled flyers they were, she led them onto a rising thermal. They ringed upward, and upward wings spread, not flapping, just tipping now, then to keep them go then to keep them going up. At two thousand feet they saw Chup far below, sitting on his dead limb above the Skohari Airy. Chup saw them, but he felt not one iota of, patern of paternalism. His duties were over. He was molting his flight feathers and chose to be alone. For the next week, Frightful watched her offspring eagerly chase the migrating birds, but could not share their excitement. She hunted from the cupola by day, and at night she flew back to the one mountain among hundreds, the one tree among millions, and Sam. Screamer shuttled between Bovina and Perry's hackboard for almost a week. The day Jose mailed his letter complaining about the utility poles, Screamer came to rest on a transformer on a pole outside Bovina. A wind gusted, he tried to balance, contacted two wires, and fell to the ground. No one was there to pick him up. Bluebill and Oxy stayed around the good hunting grounds of Delhi with Frightful. They soared with her outside, over the countryside, learning to catch rats, mice, and pigeons. They became expert vermin hunters until Bluebill found a cliff near the Pepticon Pep 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 Reservoir. There, thousands of migrating waterfowl came down to rest on the water. They were easy to catch, and when they moved on, he went with them. His early visual memory of life with Perry was forgotten. He followed the birds. He was not, after all, imprinted. But Frightful was. She was held captive by her early training with Sam. One day, she watched a flock of doves disappear over the mountains. She followed them for a short distance, then flew back to the cupola on the courthouse. At dawn the next day, she returned to her mountain and the next, next box on the steel pole. Sam was opening the mill sluice to start the water wheel for Bandle, now a busy father. He saw a shadow flash over the water and looked up. Frightful, he shouted. He held up his hand but did not whistle. Frightful hesitated, circled, and then did something she had never done before. She flew down to his hand without hearing Sam's whistle. Alighting as gently as thistledown, she curled under her toes and to keep her talons from piercing his bare hand. Beautiful bird, Sam told, said to her, why do you honor me with this visit? Cree, 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 she called softly, leaving off the curry that said Sam. He studied her. Her new feathers were darker and more lustrous than last year. Her eyes were more brilliant and wide open. She was breathing regularly and her breath was sweet. You're one healthy and beautiful bird, she, he said. I thought you were here because you need me, but you aren't, were you? Frightful, why, you aren't, why are you here? Frightful faced south. Ah, that's it, you're leaving. You've come to tell me goodbye. Slowly, he reached out and stroked her gleaming black head. Cree, cree, he piped, but Frightful did not respond. She looked up at the trees that closed off the sky, beat her wings, circled Sam's head, and climbed out of the forest. Goodbye, he called and stopped. Hey, what are you doing? You're flying the wrong way. Frightful was flying back to Delhi. As she passed over Molly's house, she saw Oxy returning to her Victorian gingerbread roost for the night. The abundant pigeons in Delhi had kept Oxy from migrating. 
As the light dimmed, the young falcon walked into her elaborate room with its curls and spindles and lay down. She got up, struck her head out into the dusk and lay down again. Something was happening to her and she was restless. The happening was migration. It was full upon the northern hemisphere. The shorter hours of sunlight and lowering temperatures were telling millions of birds to go south. The event had begun in mid-August. The loons, geese, ducks, and shorebirds had heard the message from the environment and had left the barrens of Alaska and Canada. A few days later, the swallows and swifts felt the change and left the northeast. And now Oxy felt it. Kettles of north, northern, northern peregrine falcons arrived in the valley. They picked out the weak and slow from the flocks of migrating birds and moved south when their prey moved south. The strong and healthy would survive to have strong and healthy offspring. The weak became life and energy for the falcons. Oxy watched, ate, and listened to the Earth's atmospheric messages. Frightful watched the migrating birds. She flew west, some south, some migrated by day and some by night. She ate well and grew fat until at last the shortening days and cold air urged her to go. But the hemlock tree and Sam urged her to stay. One chilly September morning, Oxy flew above Delhi, circling old haunts, the bridge, the cupola, and Frifles Mountain. Near Bovina, she got in onto a thermal and ringed up and up. Spiraling with her was Chuck. He peeled off at the top of the warm bubble and shot southward. Oxy peeled off at the top and joined the great North American bird migration. It was mid-September. From the bridge top, Frightful saw her go. She lowered her body to fly, straightened up, and sat still. An hour later, she turned to the hemlock. She bobbed her head and up and down and nervously stacked and restacked her tail feathers. She flew back to the bridge. She flew to the cupola. Nothing was right. In October, she returned to John Wood's home. Alighting on the corrected transformer pole, she waited for Susan to appear with food. She saw only the boy who took care of the farm when the woods were gone. The pigeon coat was noisy. The rat cages were correctly smelly, but all were somehow wrong. She flew over the Schoolhury River Reservoir, where she had weathered a storm. Frightening messages from the rays of the sun told her she was going the wrong way. She flew back to the one mountain among hundreds, the one tree among millions, and Sam. Mole was in the tree snoozing on Sam's bed, and Jesse Coon James was in a hollow dozing in winter le le lethargy. Sam and Alice were sitting around a small fire, cracking hickory nuts and putting the meats in the clay tureens for the winter. Zella named her Samantha, Sam said. Isn't that nice? I know, I know, replaced, re replied Alice. How many times have you told me that? I saw her and she's too little for such a big name. She'll grow up. They'll call her Sam and then what? That's even better, he said. Alice stuffed a large piece of hickory meat into her mouth. Cree, cree, cree. Sam jumped to his feet. Alice, he said, it's frightful. She's here. She's not going to migrate. What do I do? Call her down and keep her, Alice answered. She would like that. I can't. Since I can't have her, I want her to be a wild peregrine falcon. She must go. Does every single solitary peregrine have to migrate? No, he answered thoughtfully. There are some who have stayed near New York City all winter because there are so many pigeons, but they are not frightful. She must be a 100% pure peregrine, sailing blue skies, journeying to new worlds, and that means she migrates. Oh, Sam, Alice said, then thought a minute. What makes birds migrate? A lot of things, but mostly lack of food supply in the cold north. They follow the food supply. Then don't feed her if you are so anxious for her to be a pilgrim falcon. I'm not going to, he said, stepping back to try to find frightful among the branches of the ancient hemlock, but primarily to keep Alice from seeing his great sadness. He wanted frightful to stay with all his heart. I'm not going to, he repeated.